if Canadians were annoyed about having a federal election last fall. A deal reached this week between the Liberals and the NDP means that they won't be going to the polls again for quite a while, about 2025 it seems. Still, it's a somewhat unusual development. With us on the significance and implications of such a pact, both in the nation's capital, Susan Delacourt, national columnist for the Toronto Star, and author and political columnist Paul Wells. Hi to you both. Hi. Um, I think uh, in journalism school, they should teach uh, students to not go to sleep on Monday or Friday because that's <laughs> when the news seems to drop. Um, Paul, I wanted to uh, start with you. What is the historical significance of this agreement between the Liberals and the NDP? Well, I mean, it's, it's highly unusual, especially at the federal level, and that's why a lot of people were, were taken by surprise. But it, uh, there's plenty of uh, precedent at the provincial level and in other parliamentary systems uh, uh, around the world, and it's entirely within the rules of parliament. Uh, basically, the, 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 the main rule about who gets to form a government in a parliamentary system is who has the support of most MPs. When a party has a majority of the members of parliament uh, all, in, all in that party's caucus, then it's easy, right? Uh, mm -hmm. You know, when uh, Trudeau was prime minister after 2015, as long as all the Liberals stayed on his side, he had a majority. Uh, it's a little dicier in a context where no party controls a majority. And usually in our system, uh, it's been uh, sort of a game that goes vote by vote. The governing party looks for support from the Bloc or the Conservatives or the NDP, either willing support or they blackmail them with threats of an election. But <laughs> it's happened in uh, British Columbia from 2017 to 2020. It's happened in Ontario in the 80s where two parties get together and say, look, we're just going to, the smaller party will promise not to vote to defeat the larger party. And for uh, the duration of that agreement, or as long as both sides keep their word, then then part, the government doesn't get defeated. Um, it's, uh, we're going to spend the rest of this segment talking about the ramifications of that, but it's definitely allowed. Uh, so help me understand this, Susan, because we've heard some politicians call this a coalition, um, but it isn't a coalition. It is an agreement. Can you help us understand the difference? Yes. Uh, if you want to know how a coalition works, watch Borgen, the uh, TV series. That's how, uh, which is famously about a very unstable um, government that depends on cabinet positions. It's actual power sharing for the um for the two parties. So if the if if Justin Trudeau had been interested in a coalition or Jagmeet Singh, they would have uh put a couple of MPs and the leader probably in a coalition. We've never I don't believe we've ever seen that in Canada, maybe during the Second World War, but um that is not uh what we're talking about here. It's not power sharing. And as Paul was saying, this is actually how government is supposed to work. We in the media, I would say, or political observers really like minority governments because uh, there's an element of surprise to it. There's also an element of negotiation and democratic back and forth. And as far as I've seen and talked to people about this deal, that's what's going to happen is the NDP has not given an unconditional uh, ticket to 2025 to, to Justin Trudeau. It's, 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 it's rounded out a deal by which they will be consulted more. Uh, and not to plug uh, TVO, but I think Borgen aired on this network at some point. Um, <laughs> but uh, Paul, Susan said this is good for, for journalist types cause, because it keeps us uh, guessing on what's happening. But is it good for the Canadian uh, people? That's, that's something the Canadian people will get a chance to pronounce on at the next election. Um, typically, these sorts of arrangements don't last beyond the next election. Because it's 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 like when two wrestlers are in a uh, a clutch and then something's got to give. So, in the most recent example, and really quite a good example of this sort of arrangement, the uh, tiny Green Party caucus uh, um, supported Premier Horgan, the NDP Premier of uh, British Columbia, until the next election, and it worked so well that. Uh, Horgan's NDP went on to a majority and didn't need anyone's support, and the Green Party kind of fell off the map. You, you, you often see things like that. That's an example of the voters deciding what they think of all of this. Um, I'll tell you from having spoken to them that a lot of conservative, I haven't spoken to all of them, I've spoken to a few of them, uh, a lot of conservative voters feel like this uh, really delegitimizes uh, their party's participation in the national debate. 
Conservative Party won the, the popular vote in the last two elections. Two elections in a row, the Conservative, there were more people voting for Conservatives than voting for Liberals. And now um, th they've essentially put a little ring fence around the Conservative caucus. They're going to govern without them. Um, as I say, that's absolutely within the rules, but uh, it smarts. Well, let's go over the agreement, and I, we're going to come back to uh, the Conservatives in a little bit, but I wanted to show some of the highlights of the agreement, um, what the Liberals and the NDP promise, uh, a new dental care program for low-income Canadians, implementing a home buyer's bill of rights, developing a plan to phase out public financing of the fossil fuel sector, prohibit the use of scabs, that word is horrible, but replacement workers, in a unionized, federally regulated industry during a lockout or strike, and an expanded election day of three days of voting. Paul, what do you think of, the, of these promises? Uh, a lot of that is, is um, current federal policy, longstanding federal policy. Uh, using replacement workers in the federally regulated workplace uh, is pretty strongly frowned upon by the current government already. Um, uh, and a lot of other, uh, you know, green retrofits and, and, and things like that are... Uh, you're, you're twisting Justin Trudeau's rubber arm. This is stuff that he already wanted to do and planned to do. Um, some aspects of it, dental care, pharma care, um, is uh, stuff that they had maybe talked about uh, or commissioned studies of, but hadn't really made uh, substantial progress. And now uh, they'll, uh, they'll face additional pressure, uh, not a requirement, but a additional pressure. They have to keep the NDP happy. And so that's going to uh, increase the pressure on them to deliver on these essentially social policy uh, fronts. And Susan, um, one of the uh, promises is a home buyer's bill of rights. We know in this country, housing is becoming mm. so expensive every day. It seems as if the prices go up. If you're waiting, uh, if you're trying to get on the ladder and you see this, um, you might get your hopes up. But how likely are any of these promises uh, to be implemented? I think there there is a reasonable chance they will be. I can tell you what the New Democrats are worried about is this is a government that doesn't do things very nimbly, uh, except for the initial pandemic response. But I, I think there is some worry that that you know they will get to a point where oh we need a little more time to do this. We we uh, we can't do it possibly right now, and that is very sort of that is on brand as they say for this government. I, I'm told that what happened here behind the scenes is that Justin Trudeau and Jagmeet Singh had a, a meeting of minds on this idea that the progressive ideas they have don't just happen in one budget. They happen in two, three, four budgets. If, if Justin Trudeau wants to leave a progressive mark on the country, and <clears throat> he says he does, then he needs a few budgets to do it. The things that the New Democrats want to achieve have similar timelines. So from their point of view, it made sense to make a long-term agreement and rather, you know, rather than doing a budget that pleases the NDP in 2022 and one that pleases the Bloc in 2023, one that they could get through over multiple years. That's my long way of answering the question that apart from dental care, which is it, it, people will feel the effects of that in the, you know, the, 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 it's being phased in. It starts with children in families earning under $90,000, I think, in the first year. And then it expands and expands to full dental care, but means-tested dental care. But that is, that's probably the most concrete thing people will see right away. But I, I you know, there are not going to be rainbows and unicorns in, uh, in the sky because of this deal. It is, it, it's, a, it's a methodical process-oriented phased in agreement. And Paul, um, NDP leader Jagmeet Singh has been asked what they would get. And he said, at any moment, if we don't get, we have this in writing, if we don't get what we want, we'll walk away. Um, in your view, who benefits more from this deal, the Liberals or the NDP? The Liberals benefit more. Justin Trudeau gets to keep being the Prime Minister. Uh, and if he wants to, he gets to, uh, he gets a little calm period during which he could uh, and his leadership and the party could, could, could find a replacement. I have no idea. Um, uh, the NDP benefits a fair bit. Uh, the, the New Democrats I've spoken to are very pleased with this. And Jagmeet Singh benefits too. In what way? He legitimizes his leadership of a party 
uh, which he has conspicuously failed to uh, deliver for in two election campaigns in a row. The NDP got rid of Tom Mulcair on the floor of their convention in, uh, NDP, in, in, in Edmonton 2017 because um, they didn't like working with him and because uh, he had um, lost many of the gains that uh, Jack Layton had, uh, had won. Um, in two elections in a row, Jagmeet Singh has not come anywhere close to the success that Tom Mulcair enjoyed. And at some point, New Democrats are going to notice that. But now they're uh, in the middle of this uh, um, uh, deal with the Liberals that uh, guarantees, uh, you know, three years of progressive government. And uh, you'd have to be a particularly self-defeating kind of New Democrat to want to blow that up just because you've got a grudge against Jagmeet Singh. There's every chance that that was part of Mr. Singh's thinking as he negotiated this deal. It's kind of hard to forget um, during the election the uh, strong words that Mr. Singh had for uh, the prime minister. Oh, to be a fly on the wall in these <laughs> conversations. Um, Susan, how do you think the NDP voters are receiving this? You know, I'm really glad you brought that up. I'm, um, I've, I've been working on a weekend piece about this, too. And I think, you know, really uh, close political watchers will remember that right after the election, there was some talk that there was going to be some kind of an agreement. And two things happened. Word leaked out of it. Um, I don't think it was as formal as what we, we've seen now. But also, I'm told that on Trudeau's side, at least, feelings were pretty raw. Um, the prime minister did a year end interview with me, uh, at the end of, uh, in December, 2021, in which he didn't want to talk about all those protests that had dogged him. He was, he was, uh, obsessed with the, what he called the casual cynicism of the left and the attacks he'd received from progressives for not uh, the accusation that he'd done nothing. So I, I, I think what happened was tempers needed to, to cool down, um, the the Justin Trudeau is a little bit got a, a quite a big thick skin actually, but um, but there the the election did run um, to extreme talk on both sides, and I think that uh, that needed to chill down. I'm told they get along. Jagmeet Singh and Trudeau now get along like a house on fire. They're uh, they it started when. Uh, the Prime Minister called Jagmeet Singh to congratulate him on the birth of his daughter at the beginning of January, and the two have um, have been having meetings, virtually mostly, uh, for the last two months, and they've, they've formed an agreement and, and trust, too. Um, and I want to bring, Paul, back your, your comment about the Conservatives, because I keep thinking that uh, Susan mentioned this close relationship uh, that's developed between Mr. Singh and uh, Justin Trudeau. Um, if you're a Conservative voter, maybe you're feeling as if you're your party's being left out of the conversation. Do you think that maybe this was a missed opportunity by the Conservatives to maybe have a similar uh, agreement with the NDP? Or do you think that it was a missed opportunity on both Mr. Singh and Mr. Trudeau's uh, part in not having a broader conversation with the Conservatives? If this is about working together as a country. So in, in a strange way, I think all of our politics, essentially since uh, at least since Donald Trump became the president of the United States, has been about the Conservative Party of Canada. Uh, and, 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 and the questions have been, um, among those people, who, among that majority who don't support the Conservative Party of Canada, is it becoming Trump-like? To the extent it's becoming Trump-like, can it be uh, blocked, stopped, uh, um, uh, contained? Uh, so... What do I mean? I, during the Wet'suwet'en-inspired protests that, um, over the coastal gasoline pipeline at the beginning of 2020 that shut down uh, rail service across the country and threatened the food supply in the country, uh, Andrew Scheer, then still the Conservative leader, got up in the House of Commons and said, a lot of this uh, activity that's causing these protests is criminal activity. Uh, we, the people who are responsible have to be um, caught, arrested, prosecuted. Um, Harsh language, but a, but a language about the application of the rule of law. Uh, the prime minister uh, immediately met with all the other opposition leaders except Andrew Scheer, and uh, on the basis that uh, a, a language of punishment and reprimand was not appropriate because these were largely indigenous protesters, and uh, the Conservative Party was not a legitimate participant in the Canadian political debate for having made that suggestion. 
Uh, much of what's happened since then flows from that moment, it seems to me. Uh, and, and so the Conservatives, did the Conservatives miss an opportunity? The Conservatives are considered by many of the other member, part, uh, members in the House of Commons not to be legitimate participants in our political debate. What, what does that mean, though, for voters, for Conservative voters? It means a lot of them are increasingly frustrated. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of them agree. Uh, uh, Ken Bosenkul, has, uh, who's, who, who's an Alberta Conservative um, who worked uh, uh, loyally uh, at senior levels for Stephen Harper when Harper was Prime Minister and before, has a piece uh, in the newsletter The Line this morning in which he says, look, we got to read the room. Uh, um, uh, the, the right wing of the Conservative Party, uh, to which arguably Ken Bosenkul belongs, is not getting... Uh, accepted into the into the debate and into the uh, um, it's getting stuff handed to it like this deal between Singh and Trudeau. So therefore, the Conservative Party's got to change and adjust. And 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 Bosenkul is essentially, without naming names, arguing that the Conservative Party needs to pick a leader like Jean Charest, much more of a '80s progressive conservative style leader. That's hardly a unanimous opinion in the party, but it's striking that it comes from people like Ken Bosenkul. Well, um, Susan, Mr. Trudeau said, Prime Minister Trudeau said that this was about bringing stability to the country because of everything that we've been through in the past two years and everything that's going on right now on a global scale. Uh, who will be giving credit if the government does implement these uh, promises? Uh, well, I, I think probably the Prime Minister will will get some bonus from this. Paul raises a really good point. You cannot ignore the Trump factor in all of this. That uh, that was the prime minister's first real jolt that, um, in when he had a majority, and some of the things you see in this deal are about turning Canada away from that Trump uh, Trump world. Don't forget uh, the electoral reform thing, making voting easier. For example, uh, in the United States, you see Republicans trying to make voting harder. That is a deliberate nod to the what's going on down below the border there. Um, also, I think that uh, you see that that the Prime Minister is leaving himself, sort of, as Paul mentioned, an opening to leave. I don't think he's ever going to say when he's leaving. No Prime Minister announces three years in advance when they're leaving. Um, but, but he has given himself um, a chance to do this. Let's not forget in Ontario, that's where this audience is, uh, there was an accord between the Liberals and New Democrats, and initially that worked out best for the Liberals. David Peterson turned that into a majority. But Bob Ray turned that into an NDP government in 1990. So, you know, that may be on the minds of um, of people here, too. This, again, as I said in, in response to a previous question, you cannot judge this thing in the short term. It's going to be a long-term thing. And, Paul, in your column, you noted that five of the last seven Canadian federal elections have returned minority governments, so it seems to be uh, it's something that Canadians want. Um, does this deal give away any leverage the NDP might have to challenge the Liberals moving forward? Mr. Singh claims not. And, and as a matter of fact, these things are honour... Uh, it's like a, um, uh, an honour bar in a hotel room. Like, you take the drink, you leave the money, um, uh, it, 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 it's up to you to keep your word. So uh, Premier Horgan uh, dumped his coalition or his supply and, 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 and um, uh, confidence partner, Cold, uh, a year short of the extent of that deal in um, uh, British Columbia. He broke the terms of a, a public agreement with the Green Party. Voters rewarded him. Um, uh, these these things are not cast in stone, and even to the extent they're written down, uh, like balanced budget rules or fixed uh, election date laws, they can be ignored with near total impunity. So, if uh, Jagmeet Singh uh, decides that um, uh, some element of his support for the Liberals is simply too hot for him politically, uh, or if he just changes his mind. Um, then, uh, then this deal is uh, is done, and the same for Justin Trudeau. Uh, Mark Garneau was his foreign minister until he wasn't his foreign minister, and that's too bad, so sad, you know. Um, as we noted, this was a surprise. It took everybody by surprise. Um, and I'm wondering, uh, Susan, um, do we get a sense if there's a consensus in the Liberal and NDP caucus about this arrangement? 
Uh, we're we're not going to hear that publicly, but um, you know, I think there is some concern about the secrecy and the uh, Trudeau has a very tight circle, and Liberal MPs are already a little annoyed about that. It's a very very tight circle. There were a lot of people who had no idea this was going on. Uh, New Democrats as well were kept in the dark deliberately. I think that's going to be. That's going to be the internal matter to settle. I think liberals who are worried about the threat from the conservatives, the blue liberals, uh, will be worried about not only the cost of this, but what their voters are thinking. I think a lot of liberals are getting messages from their constituents saying, hey, I didn't vote for you because you leaned to the NDP. I voted for you because um, I'm a traditional liberal who likes the Paul Martin kind of liberal um, you know, the budget balanced liberals. So I, I I don't know that it's enough to upset the deal, but I wouldn't say there's any unanimity uh, yet. Uh, and Paul, you said that, uh, you mentioned that uh, the prime minister is not going to make an announcement that I'm leaving the party. Um, do you see Jagmeet Singh staying on as leader post 2025? Um, these are both relatively young men. Um, they're younger than me, so I think they're just incredibly young. Uh, um, <laughs> and they can, uh, 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 Trudeau himself is still nine years younger than Jean Chrétien was the day that Chrétien was first elected prime minister. Um, and, and so there's all the room in the world for, for um, uh, these folks to decide that things are going well. In Jagmeet Singh's case, it's because expectations, uh, New Democrats' expectations for their own party have, I think, properly been ratcheted way down from the uh, short period of euphoria after 2011 when they thought winning 103 seats was normal. Um, and uh, Trudeau, the, the, I want to call it discipline. The, 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 the voluntary allegiance within the Liberal caucus and the broader Liberal Party for what Justin Trudeau does is uh, beyond compare to anything I've seen in the recent factionalized history of the Liberal Party of Canada. Justin Trudeau is uncontested within the Liberal Party of Canada and will be, as far as I'm concerned, for the foreseeable future. And um, uh, so if he likes the view, he's going to stick around. And if he feels like he's uh, done enough or if he's, you know, if voters get the final word and if he's not sure he likes what that's, how that's shaping up, then, um, then he'll leave and on the day he leaves, he'll get nothing but plaudits from his party. And Susan, the Conservative Party has been going through a lot of changes, and there was a lot of excitement coming up for September because that's when they would choose their next uh, federal uh, leader. Do you think this impacts that at all? Yes, very much. In what uh, ways? First of all, uh, if, uh, Paul alluded to Ken Bosenkul's um, uh, column, and I think that is an important thing, that, that the Conservatives are taking a harder look at the centre right now because there will be Liberals, blue Liberals, uh, to get from uh, from this. Also, whoever is named leader on September 10th has a lot more time to... Uh, that, that gets rid of the urgency to elect somebody who's already in the House. It gives somebody time to build a team. Uh, so look to, you know, uh, a big federal team. So that's an interesting new development too. I, I think it has changed... Um, Maybe not fundamentally, but certainly set the Conservatives on a different kind of timeline. And Paul? I'm, I'm struck by, when Angela Merkel was the uh, Chancellor of Germany, the slogan for her party, which is traditionally a, a, a Conservative party, was Die Mitte. It means the middle. She used to walk onto stages at conventions, and there'd be a great big sign behind it saying the middle. Um, that middle is now orphaned in Canadian politics. There's room for an entire political party stretching from John Manley and Anne McClellan on the managerial liberal left to uh, uh, the inheritors of Jim Prentice and James Moore on the, on the managerial conservative right. Um, and and uh, uh, most of those people don't feel like Justin Trudeau's liberals or anyone's conservatives really speak to them. Now... Um, you know, don't cry for them. Country doesn't need uh, essentially Bay Street people uh, to be happy for, for for government to work. But it's a it's a striking development, and um, politics doesn't long tolerate a vacuum. 
And Susan, I'll give you the last minute. Uh, another election is on <laughs> the horizon here in Ontario. Do you see a scenario where the uh, Liberal, the Ontario Liberals, and the NDP form a coalition? Or sorry, <laughs> an agreement. <laughs> Whatever. Coalition Whatever. Is, yeah. Um, my colleague in uh, at Queen's Park, Martin Redcon, has done some work on this. I don't see it happening while an election is looming. Uh, they're they're. I, you know, they'll be watching it carefully. It does change things uh, in Ontario too, I believe. But um, I don't think it's it. I don't think you're going to see Stephen Del Duca and Andrea Horvath out uh, campaigning together for a coalition, an alliance, an accord during this campaign. I think that's off the table right now. You said it does change things in Ontario. What did you mean by that? Uh, just because of what Paul was talking about too. Mm -hmm. The center. The center is. Is an interesting place, and it, it, I, you know, Ontario thinks of itself as the center too. It is, uh, I can say, as an Ontarian, <laughs> and um, I, I think that uh, as as long as we're having a conversation about where that center exists, Ontario is. That's what I'm going to be watching during the campaign for sure. Is where is that big center going? Paul and Susan, it's been a thrill for me to chat with you because I'm a big fan of both of yeah. you. Uh, thank you so much for your insights. I know you're very, very busy, and hopefully you can catch a nap on the weekend. <laughs> <laughs> thank Thanks. you so much. Thanks very much. Thank you. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.